It is such a privilege and pleasure to be here today. Um, Tamid uh, mentioned um, two things. First of all, that um, uh, I hadn't been to Bangladesh before. That's true in a physical sense, but uh, we've had a shared journey with Tamid's um, uh, inspiring group uh, here, and our hearts and our souls, our minds and our hopes have been here for more than a decade. Um, and it's um, such a um, um, impactful and transforming um, experience uh, for Mike and myself to be here at this moment as we work um, in our preclinical models are being translated um, into human studies that I'd like to talk to you about today. But I um, am not the only representative um, of the lab um, that is here today. Um, this is a snapshot of, of who we are um, in St. Louis. Um, there's an African proverb, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's certainly my own personal experience and the experience of um, those in the lab. Um, we have partnered um, with Hamid's group um, and we have gone much farther than we would have ever hoped to travel and there is much, much more to do. So in many respects, all the work that has been done has brought us to a place where we can begin to do all the things that we have dreamed of doing. And I'd like to give you a, a report uh, about what that journey has been like um, and highlight some of the people who have participated in it to date. So Tamid used the term gut microbiota um, and gut microbiome. I just want to um, define those terms again. Uh, uh, the microbiota being the collection of organisms uh, that live in the gut. The genes embedded in the genomes of those organisms we'll call collectively the microbiome. And the gut is the uh, home to the largest collection of microbes in our body. Um, these communities begin to form at birth. Um, that process of assembly of this community, composed of all three domains of life on Earth, uh, dominated by bacteria, but also including archaea and members of eukarya and their viruses, um, that assembly process um, uh, is a mysterious process. Um, and it's linked to what has inspired us um, with respect to having a different view of human development, one that considers the assembly of our microbial communities, as well as um, the development of our cells and organs, and whether some of the long-term sequelae of undernutrition, stunting, um, impaired neurodevelopment, uh, alterations in the functioning of the innate and adaptive immune system, the failure to surmount those problems um, in sequelae with current therapy, could that be due to something that we haven't thought about, something that we're missing when we conceptualize disease pathogenesis? So the hypothesis that I'd like um, to test together with you is that there's an aspect of human developmental biology that involves our microbial community and that there is a definable normal to this assembly process focused on the gut. And that uh, part of the problems um, with undernutrition, both in terms of its pathogenesis as well as the manifestations, uh, these long-term sequelae, has to do with the disruption in this developmental process. Um, a corollary to this hypothesis is that healthy growth of children is linked to healthy development of the microbiota. And that there may be this window in early postnatal life where we could not only monitor the development of the microbiota, but if there are perturbations in that development, we may be able to intervene early. Because, another corollary, is that if we were good stewards, or are good stewards, of the microbial community development of our infants and children, and that they are endowed with a healthy microbial community at the end of this process, the impact may be long-term impact in determining the physiological properties of individuals, um, including uh, their metabolism, their immunity, even their neurobiology. 
So how to define normal, uh, how to define healthy development, is the first step in this journey. And that would be defined in one population, and then you could ask whether that generalizes to other populations of children living in different parts of the world, uh, representing different cultural traditions and environmental exposures. The next step in the journey would be to quantify deviations from normal uh, that might be associated with a disease state. So are there alterations in the configuration of microbial communities associated with disease? If there is a significant correlation uh, between those alterations and severity of disease, you're left with a third step in the challenge, which is, is that an effect of disease or is it a cause? So a test of causality will be required. If you're able to establish causality, then the final hurdle, can you intervene and repair the abnormalities in a microbial community? Can you do that effectively, safely, both in the short and long term, and in a durable fashion? Those are the challenges that we uh, are going to face together in considering whether, as according to the hypothesis, there is perturbed development in the microbial community of children uh, with undernutrition, and that's causally related to pathogenesis. So how to define normal? Um, we turn to Kamid um, and his wonderful team, um, including Saida, um, and uh, characterized microbial community development in a birth cohort uh, residing in Mirpur, where monthly fecal samples were obtained from members of this birth cohort from month one through month 24 initially. And those children uh, who demonstrated consistently normal anthropometry um, were um, the focus of our initial attention. So a subgroup of this birth cohort that had healthy growth phenotypes. And the fecal samples that were obtained uh, were subjected to DNA isolation. And we focused on a gene um, that was represented in their microbiomes, um, a gene that was present in or is present in all bacteria. It's a barcode of life. It's a gene that encodes the principal RNA in a small subunit of ribosomes. It's called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And although it's present in all bacteria, there are variations in the DNA sequence that allows us to categorize microbial life, bacterial life, in a developing gut community. So we can, without culturing, define what bacterial organisms are present in the developing microbial community and follow these children through the first two years of life and ask, who's there? That's a large data set that's generated, but we want to focus in on those sets of bacterial organisms that are most indicative of the development of the community, most age discriminatory. So you can use and we use machine learning algorithms. Uh, Satish Subramanian, who's shown in the lower right uh, of this uh, slide here, uh, is a very talented MD, PhD student. And he applied machine learning algorithms to this data set of 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences and identified a group of very age discriminatory bacterial strains that were present in children with healthy growth phenotypes living in Mirpur. Now let me just describe um, these organisms which are not named here. Um, each row in this heat map represents one of these age discriminatory strains that were identified using machine learning algorithms. Each column represents a monthly age bin and we're gonna go from month one to month 24. Some organisms, some of these age discriminatory uh, bacterial species are very abundant early in postnatal life and become more diminutive as time proceeds. Other <coughs> organisms become more prominent later um, during the period of complementary feeding. Those are shown here. If I take a vertical slice through this um, heat map and tally up the proportional representation of these uh, age discriminatory strains, measure the levels of these age discriminatory strains, I can basically take a snapshot of the developmental process 
and use this microbial signature to assign an age or state of development to the microbial community. So these organisms, which are represented uh, across these biologically unrelated, healthy children living in Mirapur, can be used to assign a state of development to the microbiome. That's very important for two reasons. It tells us that there is an order to the process of community assembly. These aren't the only organisms that are present in the developing gut microbiota, but they're most indicative of the different stages of assembly of the community. They're also represented in the gut microbiota of children living elsewhere because our studies of other birth cohorts, children with consistently healthy anthropometry, living in geographically disparate parts of the world uh, with different cultural and culinary traditions, shows that these organisms are represented as well. So there's some um, generality to this process of community assembly. Now what if we use this microbial signature to look at the state of development of the microbiota in children with SAM, severe acute malnutrition. This is exactly um, what we did together in partnership with Tamid because there were a number of studies that were being conducted of children with SAM and MAM. This is a child who presented to the Nutritional Rehabilitation Unit with SAM. That child um, is 18 months of age. Now this is a, a, a plot that computes microbiota age, defined in the way I just described, looking at the proportional representation of each of these age discriminatory strains, plotted against chronological age. And these represent the members of the reference healthy cohort with consistently normal anthropometry. This is the computed mean and standard devi deviation from microbiota age of those children at one month, two months, all the way up to 24 months. And you can see a correlation between in the healthy chronological age and microbiota age. The child with SAM is chronologically 18 months of age, but that child's microbiota appears to be that of an eight-month-old. This child has significant microbiota immaturity, and we can compute the deviation from normal in the following way. This is the standard deviation for healthy. How many standard devia deviations away from the mean of this reference group is this child's microbiota age? In other words, can we have a different metric, microbiota for age Z score? This child with SAM is um, more than a standard deviation below what you would expect based on chronologic age for the state of development of his microbiota. So we have a definition of normal, and we have a way of quantifying deviations from normal. It turns out, um, when this study was done with Tamid and published in 2014, two observations were made. The severity of microbiota immaturity was greater in SAM than in MAM, and standard therapy did not repair this microbiota immaturity. Of course, standard therapy for resuscitation of children with SAM or MAM um, was not based on knowledge of or consideration of the developmental biology of the microbiota. These children um, were subjected to these interventions, but they were left with a persistent developmental abnormality, one affecting a microbial organ, their gut microbiota. So is that persistent immaturity, that failure to repair, causally related to the pathogenesis of undernutrition, or is it simply an effect? We need to do a test of causality. I'm going to give you a little bit more information about what I just said, because this is a non-inferiority study that uh, Tamid and his group uh, did, um, looking at the effects of three different uh, therapeutic foods um, on um, uh, the health state of children uh, with SAM. Um, the study design uh, involved uh, an enrollment, uh, an initial resuscitation using uh, standard protocols, um, 
at the uh, isolation of um, fecal samples, initial blood draw, um, a period of treatment, um, also with uh, fecal samples collected at the end of treatment, um, another blood draw, and then what is truly magnificent and so important for this field, the capacity to do long-term <coughs> studies where each individual is studied over a period of time, not cross-sectional, but longitudinal uh, study. So in this case, monthly fecal sampling for six months post-discharge, and then every other month for another six months, um, and a key blood draw at six months post-treatment. So this is, uh, unfortunately, the uh, too often set of observation. Uh, these children come in uh, with anthropometry indicating that they have SAM. Um, a number of them are left at the end of treatment with, with MAM, so they have post-SAM MAM. Their stunting uh, has not been affected, improved uh, with treatment, standard therapy, and their MAZ scores, again, uh, not, sufficiently, uh, not sufficient repair of their microbiota immaturity. We can look at the developmental biology of the microbiota not only from the perspective of which organisms are there, looking at the microbiota, but looking at the microbiome and ask what are the representation of microbial genes that are components of different metabolic pathways, metabolic pathways for biosynthesis of amino acids, metabolic pathways for the biosynthesis of key vitamins, microbial metabolic pathways for the processing of otherwise indigestible polysaccharides present in the diet. And if we apply machine learning algorithms um, to the representation of these pathways in healthy children, sampled monthly during the first several years of life, we can see, um, shown here in small print, that certain pathways are very prominent early in postnatal life. Each row here represents uh, a metabolic pathway. We're looking at the proportional representation of genes and the microbiome assigned to that pathway. Some are more prominent early in postnatal life and become more diminutive. Others become more prominent later. We can apply machine learning algorithms to define normal functional maturation of the microbiome. And we see, just as we consider the age discriminatory organisms, if we look at these age discriminatory metabolic pathways, that there is persistent functional immaturity in children who are presenting with acute malnutrition. And that current therapy does not repair that immaturity. It takes approximately two years for this community to assemble, defined in this way, to a mature state. Um, that mature state is not achieved in children with SAM or MAM. In this particular case, uh, with these three different interventions, we find that there is persistent um, underrepresentation of pathways, multiple pathways involved in the production of essential amino acids, of um, certain vitamins, notably B vitamins, as well as pathways for carbohydrate utilization. Again, is this immaturity an effect or is it a cause? One other thing, and I hope that uh, um, there are several lessons that will come about um, as a result of our conversation today. One is to consider the developmental biology of humans uh, in a more holistic way, considering the microbial communities that we harbor. Another is how incredibly important it is to do um, longitudinal studies in order to define the effects of disease and interventions designed to ameliorate that disease uh, on the microbiota. And uh, lastly, to um, invest the time uh, that is required to obtain a deeper and more comprehensive uh, definition of biological state. Um, we have, we, Mike, myself, and Tamid's team, uh, a dream. And that is that we will not use anthropometry uh, to classify childhood under nutrition but we will obtain a detailed molecular profile of the biological state of children presenting with SAM or MAM that will allow us to look at the levels of biomarkers and mediators of all numbers of physiologic, metabolic, immunologic, and neurobiological processes. 
uh, so that there will be a subclassification of uh, children with SAM. Um, what is the state of their metabolic regulators? What is the state of um, uh, mediators of bone development? What is the state of regulators of um, the innate and adaptive immune system? So we uh, began in this non-inferiority uh, trial together with Hamid to obtain such a comprehensive definition um, of biological state. And towards the end, you'll see, as we design our interventions, how this investment is so critical um, to advancing our knowledge of how to repair microbiota immaturity. So these children, the SAM, if you do mass spectrometry of their plasma and look at a series of metabolites, come in with rampant lipolysis, uh, as you might expect, um, with um, high levels of even, even chain acyl carnitines, um, high levels of ketones and free fatty acids. At the time of discharge, uh, that rampant lipolysis is dampened, and there's a switch to amino acid metabolism, and we can see that by elevations in plasma levels of a number of different amino acids. I'll give you an example here. That was, uh, this um, uh, uh, bar plot shows levels of valine and also leucine and isoleucine in the enrollment blood sample, in the discharge blood sample, and in the six month post follow-up sample. And you can see that at um, discharge, um, there is a significant increase in plasma levels of valine and leucine and isoleucine, but that effect is transient, so um, they regress metabolically. The branch chain amino acids are particularly interesting because uh, branch chain amino acids uh, directly activate mTOR, and uh, mTOR activated um, receptors uh, uh, for insulin and insulin-like growth factors are very important uh, for a variety of features of uh, healthy growth. So to find the metabolic phenotypes, but also use a technology that I'm going to get uh, to a little bit later that has come out recently that we are very big believers in. There have been the development um, of DNA-based aptamers, modified short segments of DNA, um, that can uh, recognize very specifically and bind to with high affinity uh, large numbers of different plasma proteins. So these aptamer-based platforms <coughs> using 100 microliters of plasma or less can measure initially the platform we use 1,304 or five uh, different plasma proteins over a broad dynamic range, a great sensitivity, and these proteins are involved in regulation of a variety of physiologic, metabolic processes, bone growth, neurobiology. Um, so um, one can use this um, assay system to quantify the plasma proteome prior to, during, and after treatment. Uh, and we've done this in this non-inferiority trial uh, and gotten a much more comprehensive definition of biological state. All right, we define normal. I've told you without showing you the data that that definition of normal based on the age and uh, discriminatory uh, strains um, and metabolic pathway generalizes. Um, and the deviations from normal are associated with severity of undernutrition. We have to do a test of causality. And this is the test of causality um, that was initially done. Um, in the lower left-hand portion of um, the PowerPoint slide is our notobiotic facility. It was established in 1996. Um, uh, it's run by two very talented people, Maria Carlson, who came from the Karolinska Institute, and Dave O'Donnell. They met in the laboratory. They fell in love and got married. Um, their child was not born in the notobiotic isolator, I can assure you, but we do perform many services in our laboratory, premarital counseling um, and a variety of other things. Um, so Dave and uh, uh, Maria have trained generations of students um, in the lab about notobiotics. So this allows us to rear mice under entirely sterile conditions. And at some point in postnatal life, you can introduce microbes into these um, mice. In this case, we're going to mirror pour uh, and uh, take um, uh, fecal samples 
um, from children um, who have healthy growth phenotypes uh, or fecal samples from children who have um, severe uh, undernutrition um, and these microbiota from these children will be immature. We can do the same thing in other parts of the world as we have done and transplant those samples from chronologically age-matched children into these germ-free animals. So groups of animals, each will receive a given donor microbiota, will take different donors, will feed all recipient mice a human diet that's representative of the diet consumed by the children whose microbiota we are testing. And the goal of this exercise is to determine whether well-preserved microbial communities, and well-preserved means that they are obtained from children and stored initially at cryogenic temperatures, minus 120, and then maintained at minus, one, at minus 80 degrees, whether that snapshot of microbial life frozen in time can be resurrected and transplanted into these recipient animals. And the process of transplantation of the microbial community, will that be accompanied by the capacity of that community to transmit a variety of the phenotypes seen in the donor? So how much of you, how much of your you can be ascribed to your microbiota? Can certain features of your biology be transmitted to these recipient mice who represent the living test tube to see whether there's a causal relationship between certain of your biological features and your microbial community configuration. So this is what was done. Young mice weaned onto a human diet representative of um, the population of interest. Can we transmit some of the growth faltering phenotypes seen in children with undernutrition? So this is one such experiment. Um, involving chronologically age-matched children, um, a group of children with SAM, uh, a group of children with healthy growth phenotypes. Um, the animals are weaned onto this representative human diet, cooked according to the culinary traditions of the population. Uh, after the transplant is done, um, uh, weight is obtained uh, serially, fecal samples are obtained serially. We can do quantitative magnetic resonance assays to look at body composition as a function of time. At the time of sacrifice, multiple tissues and blood are obtained. Bones are subjected to microcomputed tomography to look at bone growth. So we're going to look at this as a function of the donor microbiota. Here, the percent initial weight is calculated versus days post-colonization. And the recipient mice who have, re who have um, been the targets of transplantation of normally maturing microbiota um, exhibit more rapid and sustained weight gain compared to mice that have received immature microbiota from stunted and wasted donors. So we can transmit a um, discordant weight gain phenotype. There's also a discordant mean body mass gain phenotype. So um, that's one manifestation of the transmitted phenotype. Uh, um, another manifestation is impaired metabolism and also impairments in bone growth. So this was an early demonstration, even though these animals are consuming the same human diet, uh, that a normally maturing microbiota confirms a growth advantage a biological advantage compared to an immature microbiota, and the microbiota operates well beyond the walls of the gut to influence many different systems and subsystems in at least this preclinical model. What Laura Blanton did, she was the one who uh, performed these experiments, was then to take the microbiota in the mice um, and examine um, the representation of different bacterial strains, apply machine learning algorithms, and ask which microbes that had been transmitted um, were correlated with different aspects of growth. So was the level of certain, the abundances of certain microbes associated with lean body mass gain, or metabolic phenotypes? These she would deem growth discriminatory strains. And she identified a series of growth discriminatory strains that were a subset of the age discriminatory strain, cultured these organisms 
from the guts of these mice. Remember, these organisms are obtained from the um, population that we eventually want to treat, sequenced the genomes, and then created a probiotic consortium of growth discriminatory strains, added them to the immature microbiota prior to transplantation of that microbiota to mice. The control group consists of the immature microbiota without supplementation with these aging growth discriminatory strains, and saw that these aging growth discriminatory strains um, ameliorated the transmitted growth-faltering phenotypes. So we have a test of causality, and we also have microbial targets. The assumption is that these underrepresented, underperforming age and growth discriminatory strains need to be boosted, not only in terms of their level, but in terms of their expressed beneficial functions. So how can we move from this test of causality to a therapy? Whatever therapeutic intervention we can conceive of, um, it must uh, satisfy several demands. First of all, it has to be culturally acceptable, it has to be affordable, and the components of the therapy have to be from sustainable sources. It would be much more complex, uh, the regulatory pathway, the expense, even the cultural acceptability, to begin with these um, growth discriminatory strains and administer them as a probiotic consortium. These are anaerobic organisms. To be able to store them uh, would be a big uh, problem in terms of a formulation. So we turned um, to complementary foods and made an assumption, uh, formulated a hypothesis uh, together with Tommy, that traditional complementary foods contain nutrients that are coveted by um, these age and growth discriminatory strains. The microbes don't see uh, chickpeas. They don't see uh, banana. What they see are the nutrients um, contained in these complementary foods. Could we mine a library of complementary foods that were consumed um, by children living in Mirpur and identify combinations of complementary food ingredients that had nutrients that would boost the levels uh, of the targeted organisms and augment, enhance their expressed beneficial function. So uh, this was a team effort um, guided by diet surveys provided by Tamid's team, Sid Venkatesh, uh, Jeanette Gehring, uh, Awe Cheng, and um, uh, their fearless leader, Mike Barrett, um, engaged in the following exercise. A pipeline for development of microbiota-directed complementary foods. I'm just gonna pause for a second and say an important consideration beyond cultural acceptability, affordability, and sustainability um, was make sure that our intervention occurred in a manner that wasn't perceived as um, interfering with WHO recommendations concerning inclusive breastfeeding. So we're gonna target the period of complementary feeding uh, for the intervention. Our strategy. Um, this slide uh, looks complicated. I'm going to try to reduce it um, to its components. Let's turn to the upper left-hand corner. What we're going to do is take organisms that were cultured from the microbiota of children living in Mirpur, the children that we want to help treat, um, and these are going to be age discriminatory, growth discriminatory strains. We're going to sequence their genomes and we're going to install that defined collection of microbes into germ-free animal. And we're going to screen different combinations of complementary foods to identify components in those combinations that um, are directly correlated to the levels of our targeted microbes. We want to boost their level. Now we'll do that screen and we'll get hits. If there is a hit, we're going to pause and think about um, the mandate that we have set, aside, set up for ourselves, which is that whatever foods that we identify have to have um, uh, a number of criteria satisfied. They have to be culturally acceptable. Uh, they have to be affordable. They also have to have satisfactory organoleptic properties, taste, smell, texture. We'll take those hits, 
will create a microbiota-directed complementary food prototype, actually multiple prototypes, and test them against this defined collection of organisms and see whether they increase the level and express beneficial function in these targeted age and growth discriminatory strains. If that is satisfied, we'll move on another step and take the immature microbiota, the intact, uncultured, immature microbiota of children with post-SAM man. Already been through conventional therapy, microbiota immaturity isn't repaired. Can our microbiota-directed complementary food prototypes repair that immaturity? And will that repair be associated with benefits to the host species, in this case, mice? If that step is achieved, we have a key decision. Do we go from mouse models containing human gut microbes, microbial communities, directly to children, or are we going to use a second species that has physiologic and metabolic properties closer to humans? We chose the second species to be pigs and did these types of experiments in notobiotic pigs. And then, and only then, do we go to human studies. So let me quickly go through what these types of um, exercises look like. Upper left-hand corner, a collection of age and growth discriminatory strains. It's a heat map. It shows the levels of these organisms in healthy children as a function of time. Each column is a monthly age bin. Each row represents one of these age and growth discriminatory strains. We're going to install that collection of microbes into germ-free animals, and then we're going to give them a whole series of complementary uh, food uh, combinations, which are shown in the lower left. So um, complementary food combination one will have uh, the ingredients shown, the relative levels of the complementary food ingredients in the initial screen are shown as a um, uh, difference in diameter of the circles. Um, these different com uh, complementary food combinations are given to these mice in different sequences, so we can screen many different combinations. Uh, different groups of mice um, have different sequences of presentation because we want to avoid hysteresis effect, um, the effects of the preceding diet on the response of the community. So the rules of the primary screen are shown. Each group of notobiotic animals receives a different sequence of complementary food combinations. Each diet is composed of six different complementary food ingredients. One ingredient is dom dominant for the diet. We do the screen. We, uh, we link levels of certain complementary foods to the fitness or abundances of our key age and growth discriminatory strains. And then um, we test the hits um, in a secondary screen where the levels of these ingredients are systematically um, varied. So about 100 diets later, we have complementary food prototypes, microbiota-directed complementary food prototypes that we can test. So, how do we learn uh, about the effects of these complementary food uh, prototypes, these microbiota-directed complementary food prototypes, on our targeted organisms? The type of experiment is shown here, done by Singh uh, Mekadish, a postdoc in the lab, uh, very talented in Chia Cheng. Um, uh, young mice um, um, are colonized with this consortium and then give, given a lead MDCF. Um, or are given standard therapy uh, for treatment of SAM, uh, milk sushi, kachuri hawa, for a sustained period of time. Um, a control group of animals um, is not colonized so that we can assess the level of nutrients that might be available to microbes, should they be in the gut, but in the absence of their presence. So we can measure the levels of amino acids, carbohydrates in the guts of these animals uh, that are germ-free, maintain as germ-free, as a function of the diet. Let me describe the results here. Let's look at uh, branched-chain amino acids. We're going to look at four groups of mice. We'll focus on the germ-free mice first. They're either given the, the MDCF prototype, one of many, or milk sushi kachuri hawa. Um, levels of leucine in the cica of these mice are equivalent. Same is true with isoleucine. Same is true with valine. So the delivery of these nutrients will be equivalent um, in this region of the gut with these different diets. But look what happens when we install that defined consortium and then feed MDCF prototype 1 uh, to the mouse. Significantly higher levels of leucine um, in these mice compared to the ones that are getting milk sushi and cherry hawa. Um, same thing with isoleucine, same thing with valine. 
Um, this MDCF increased the level of our targeted microbes. Uh, it also altered gene expression. The pathways for biosynthesis of these um, essential amino acids are affected by the um, um, complementary foods. These microbes are making essential amino acids. Um, so the microbial community is an important source of essential amino acids, including branched-chain amino acids. We can look in this defined community at metabolites in the gut. We can also look at gene expression in these organisms because we know their genome sequences. We can determine what they are doing as a function of different MDCFs. We take lead MDCFs and look at the effects of um, the MDCFs on host biology, bone growth with this particular MDCF in colonized animals, significant increase in femoral cortical uh, bone area compared to colonized mice getting milk sushi kachuri hollow, um, significantly greater than germ-free control, IGF-1 levels in serum significantly higher, signaling to the IGF pathway in liver significantly greater. So we're seeing that there is uh, beneficial effects on host biology. We can go to the next stage in the development of these MDCFs. In this particular case, we're going to take a post-SAM man microbiota transplanted into mice and feed them um, the hits that are emerging from the screen. Mirpur 18 is a diet designed to resemble those diets consumed by children 18 months of age living in Mirpur. Uh, we can supplement Mirpur 18 diet with one of the hits uh, that we got from our screen, in this case, uh, uh, peanut flour. We can supplement uh, the diet with several hits that we got from our screen, and that includes um, uh, uh, peanut uh, flour, uh, chickpea flour, um, banana, and soy flour. And uh, take these diets, apply it to this microbiota, and look at the effects on the function of the microbiota. In this case, we look at microbial gene expression. Um, we can also look at metabolism using mass spectrometry. And we see that um, this combination um, produces a significantly greater expression of genes involved in amino acid biosynthesis, branched-chain amino acids, tryptophan, mycin, compared to the unsupplemented diet. We can do gene expression profiling in the gut epithelium recover many of the animals with immunohistochemistry and see that there's evidence for enhanced barrier function. So we have hits, MDCF leads, coming out of these uh, studies. Um, we go to a second species, re-derive um, piglets as germ-free by taking a sow who weighs 350 kilograms on the 113th day of gestation and doing a cesarean section anesthetize the sow so that none of the piglets um, take a single breath between the time they're removed from the uterus and the time they're put through a germicidal dip tank and brought into a germ-free. If the piglets take a single breath, between the time they're removed from the uterus and the time they're brought through the germicidal dip tank, they'll be contaminated by environmental microbes. And a given sow will have 12 up to 18 piglets, so you have to operate very quickly and the level of anesthesia is absolutely critical and you have to have a level of anesthesia that uh, prevents that single breath from being taken but can't be so deep that you can't resuscitate the piglets in the notobiotic isolator. So this methodology, see that uh, how way here is uh, uh, doing something that I'll describe in a second. These are piglets in our metabolic isolator. These piglets are re-derived uh, as germ-free. They're given a bovine milk product that's altered to look like sow's milk. It's called sowina. It's irradiated. The first four days of uh, postnatal life, exclusively milk fed. And then they're colonized with a group of aging growth discriminatory strains that are our therapeutic target. They're weaned onto different MDCF prototypes. One prototype will contain all four of those leads I described. Another one will be uh, only supplemented with two of those uh, prototypes. Um, 
the animals will be monitored um, after weaning in terms of their weight gain. And you can see that um, these animals that receive the MDCF prototype for all four leads um, have significantly greater rates of weight gain compared to those that have a prototype with only two ingredients. These prototypes are isocaloric. Um, so there's a significant growth advantage in the second species. Bone growth, uh, as uh, defined by uh, micro CT, um, is also increased. Our therapeutic targets, the levels uh, in the gut are significantly greater with the four component um, uh, prototype uh, compared to the two component. So we have uh, leads emanating from our preclinical model, which brings us to um, the questions that were on your mind, which is, can we repair microbiota immaturity in children uh, with acute malnutrition, in this case, children with MAM? Um, what is the biological state of these children prior to the intervention? Can we repair that immaturity with these uh, MDCF prototypes? Um, can we achieve significant levels of repair that are impactful to host biology? Um, and uh, what is the generality of the repair that we see across a group of children? Um, the ability to repair a microbiota uh, towards a healthy state is a very important moment in time because that repair process involves changes in the representation of different components of the microbiota. How those components correlate with the operations of different host systems and subsystems allows us to connect elements of the microbiota to the functioning of those systems and uh, subsystems. Let me be more specific in a moment in terms of what I mean. So uh, the study that was conducted by uh, Tamid's team um, in Mirpur, uh, Tamid, Shida, and his magnificent group did the following. Children with MAM were enrolled in this pre-POC study. Um, at the time of enrollment, um, there was a fecal sample obtained, um, anthropometry, um, two weeks uh, of monitoring uh, the fecal microbiota. Uh, at the initiation of treatment, uh, a blood draw, uh, anthropometry, fecal samples, weekly fecal samples for four weeks, a blood draw, and then continued fecal sampling and anthropometry for another two weeks. Uh, four different uh, um, arms in the trial, uh, three involving different MDCF formulations, another involving standard of care, RUSF. Um, the uh, diets uh, are matched for energy density um, uh, in the distribution of um, calories in fat and in protein. The children um, are fed under supervision twice a day in a feeding center established uh, by Tamid's team uh, right in Mirpur, um, two portions, 125 kilocalories uh, and 25 grams each. All the formulations uh, had undergone um, acceptability testing of their organoleptic properties. Um, so uh, this was the study design. Um, it was a small tri uh, trial involving a total of 63 uh, children. We didn't expect there to be significant changes in linear growth, but we took that investment that I alluded to before um, and um, uh, uh, define the biological state using plasma proteomics. So on the left um, are um, proteins in plasma whose levels discriminate healthy children from children who have untreated SAM. Um, these are healthy discriminatory proteins, the top 50. Um, the right series of columns show uh, a series of proteins whose levels are most discriminatory for SAM. That inventory um, of uh, proteins um, were used to um, monitor the effects of the different interventions. Um, red would indicate that levels of protein increased uh, between um, initiation of treatment and end of treatment. And you can see that uh, there's a column under MDCF2 of proteins whose levels <coughs> rose for treatment. All the levels are row normalized. So there's a whole series of proteins 
that are associated with a healthy state that are boosted in the plasma proteome by MDCF2. Similarly, MDCF2 produced a general suppression or lowering of the levels of SAM discriminatory protein. These proteins are involved in many aspects of healthy growth. Um, they are regulators of bone growth. They are regulators of innate and adaptive immunity. They are regulators of metabolism. They are regulators of neural development. Um, so we see through this investment profound changes in biological state associated with MDCF2 and the definition of a lead. And these are some of the proteins that we see change. Uh, we're focusing on markers and mediators of osteoblast differentiation and maturation. See the distinctive increase in levels of these proteins with MDCF2. They include proteins like osteopontin, bone sialoprotein 2, BMPs, matrix metalloproteases. Proteins involved in a variety of signaling pathways that regulate osteoblastogenesis. The bone forming cells, the operations of these cells are augmented by MDCF2. Neurodevelopment, a whole series of proteins that are growth factors. Um, BDNF, there are tropin receptors, survival growth and differentiation of neurons, natrin receptors involved in neuronal cell survival, um, axonal guidance proteins, uh, all change towards a healthy state um, with MDCF2. I can show you many of these plots um, associated with metabolic regulation and immunity. Now, is this change, this dramatic change in health status as mirrored through um, the plasma proteome associated with repair of the microbiota? Um, I talked about MAZ scores early on, but those scores are based on considering a group of age discriminatory strains in isolation, not the interactions between those uh, strains with one another. And a key thing that we must know in order to understand the dynamics and organization of the microbiota is not a list of parts, but rather a, a knowledge and understanding of the interaction of parts. And the metaphor is that you wouldn't understand the schooling of fish, the flight of birds and flocks, or ants foraging if you just tallied the parts and didn't look at the interactions. And the number of potential interactions between components of the microbiota, whether you consider organisms or genes or gene products, is astronomical. If you had 100 different organisms and uh, wanted to compute the total number of pairwise and higher order interactions that might be possible, um, theoretically, you would get a number like 10 to the 30th. So a lot of our effort, and this was led by Arjun Raman, is to study interactions between components of a microbiota a healthy microbiota, um, and to do so um, in ways that would produce a smaller list of interacting um, parts that would describe the larger organization. It's called feature reduction. And a key step in the field of microbiome research is to look at these interactions and to achieve feature reduction. So you have to look to other fields to know how to do this, um, and fields have taught us how to perform feature reduction. Um, uh, one field is quantitative finance, and people for a long time have been looking at the operation of stock markets and how that's related to economic sectors by looking at um, co-varying components of these complex systems. So co-varying um, um, uh, co-variations between um, stocks and how that relates to economic sectors has given rise to a field called econophysics. And Arjun used the same sort of concepts to look at co-variation of organisms in healthy microbiota and found a group, a network of co-varying taxa, um, consistently co-varying taxa in healthy microbiota that he called an eco-group. They include a number of the age and growth discriminatory strains. So if we look at this network, the taxa, and try to describe um, normal gut development, um, in children living in Mirpur. It's a very um, good portrayal. Um, that portrayal can generalize to other populations. And we can also look at the state of disrepair, as Arjun did. And this is a, a PCA plot, and I just want to show you the location of um, healthy microbiota is judged by the representation of these ecogreep taxa. These are the microbial communities of children with SAM prior to treatment with standard therapy, 
at discharge from that non-inferiority child, one month post-discharge, six months post-discharge, 12 months post-discharge, you never get to a configuration that looks like healthy. This is man untreated. Um, this is what happens uh, with MBCF1, with RUSF, with MBCF3, but with our lead that produced a dramatic change in the plasma proteome, you approach a healthy state. So MBCF2 was not only the one that produced the greatest change in mediators of myriad aspects of healthy growth, it was the one that produced the greatest repair. So that um, gave rise to um, our uh, summary for the pre-POC study that was reported recently um, that in this first in human study with MBCF prototypes, we identified a lead that mitigated a variety of abnormalities associated with an undernourished state, um, acquisition of features characteristic of healthy growers, and um, that lead, MBCF2, has been advanced together with a control RUSF to an ongoing study um, that Tamid's group is performing. Um, it's a longer study with more children um, at an urban and rural site. In the case of children with primary MAM, um, um, they will be given uh, RUSF or MDCF2 for three months um, and a one month follow up, though we're hoping for a six, uh, 12, 18, and 24 month follow up. In the case of children with post SAM MAM, they will come in with SAM, they are coming in with SAM. Um, standard therapy for the rehabilitation and treatment, and then at discharge, um, they will either be randomized to RUSF or MBCF2. Again, a three-month period of treatment to see how far we can push um, the repair of the microbiota, how durable it is, and what the effect sizes will be. And because we have a lot of plasma samples, we'll be able to correlate changes in the plasma proteome with clinical biomarkers. We can do something else and are doing something else that's important, which is to take the pre-treatment samples from the pre-POC study and re-enroll them uh, into another type of trial. It's a preclinical trial. We we'll take the pre-treatment sample, we are taking the pre-treatment sample and implanting them into germ-free animals, and then subjecting that um, microbiota to all arms of the study. So for a child, you can only randomize to one arm, but if you take their microbiota pretreatment and put them to four different groups of animals, we can compare and contrast the effects of different treatment on the microbiota and host biology, and also look at the biotransformation of the different MCFs <coughs> by the microbiota to look at the bioactives. So a key, a key point is that you can reverse translate um, from these studies by taking these pretreatment microbiota and to form these more detailed mechanistic studies. We can also begin to use these pretreatment samples to develop other MDCS through structure activity relationships uh, that may have either equivalent or greater um, efficacy. Uh, and it's important if we're going to go to different areas um, uh, to have culturally acceptable formulations where the food staples will have sufficient concentrations of bioactives, uh, but would be um, um, more acceptable from a variety of different perspectives. No, I'm fine. Um, I'd like to just end, I know you've been more than patient, uh, and I've gone a little bit over time, with three slides um, um, to tell you about one other arm of our study, uh, together with Tom Eade. Um, and that has to do with terra incognita, the small intestinal microbiota, and wondering whether these children that we're studying and other children um, have an enteropathy affecting their small intestine. Um, so many of you know from um, uh, interaction with Tamid's group um, that there is a study called B, um, where children um, come in and um, are um, either uh, already stunted, um, uh, with LAZ scores um, less than two or uh, regarded at risk for stunting with LAZ less than minus one, and then are given an intervention, not an MDCF, uh, for a period of time. And those that are not responsive to that intervention are subjected to endoscopy. So this mysterious entity um, of um, environmental enteropathy associated with uh, changes in the histology of the small intestine, the bill is blunting, disruption of the epithelium, 
pronounced uh, infiltrate the, the immune cells, whether these children have this enteropathy and uh, whether we can develop a whole new set of more informative biomarkers and mediators of the enteropathy. Um, so, very quickly, um, these children who undergo endoscopy um, have duodenal aspirates, um, they have a biopsy, they have a fecal sample, and they also have a plasma sample. And what we're doing is using the same aptamer-based proteomics to compare and contrast their plasma proteome and those of healthy children, um, and try to identify um, EED discriminatory mediators of gut barrier um, disruption. Um, the comparisons are with healthy, uh, the comparisons are with the cohorts with SAM and NAM that we have. We're also um, doing culture-independent analysis of their proximal small intestinal microbiota, uh, and we're culturing um, the organisms that live in their proximal small intestine, and sequencing the genomes of these organisms, and then installing them into germ-free animals. That's a test of causality, and uh, this is my last slide. Um, and it's to say that uh, cultured members of the duodenal microbiota from these children with biopsy-proving EED and introduced into germ-free animals fed a prototypic Mirapur diet transmit an enteropathy with barrier disruptions, increased uh, crip length, um, um, gene expression profiles indicating that there's a profound impact on the uh, integrity of the gut barrier. So it's going to be very important, I think, for us to um, consider the degree to which this enteropathy applies to um, um, children with um, uh, acute malnutrition. So again, going back to the shared dream of not considering acute malnutrition based on anthropometry, but a much more sublime and comprehensive molecular definition of their pathobiology, understanding the state of uh, representation of key mediators of um, the development and proper functioning of many different systems and subsystems. Healthy community development. Look at, conceptualize the developmental biology of humans from the perspective of our communities. Realize that um, an aspect of prevention in the future will be to monitor the developmental biology of the microbiota. And we have a window in the first few years of life to not only detect deviations from normal, but to try to repair using some of the strategies I just described. Faulty assemble. We have this uh, dynamic, but absolutely essential component of our healthy growth. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>